The rapid growth in technology sector in Africa is an indication of a positive shift towards the fourth industrial revolution, which the continent, if well poised, could benefit enormously. Rwanda is already positioning itself to reap these benefits, having placed technology and innovation at the heart of its economic development. Welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. In this episode, we look at the recently launched Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution in Rwanda, as well as the country's efforts to promote and leverage on the revolution. I'll be your host, Tessie Carvin. Coined by Professor Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, the term Fourth Industrial Revolution has been characterized by a range of new technologies, including artificial intelligence, robotics, the Internet of Things, among others. Rwanda is already experiencing the dawn of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. In Rwanda, we have already witnessed the emergence of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, from using drones for blood delivery to delivering more equitable access to finance through micro-lending using blockchain, and also healthcare being driven by artificial intelligence. These emerging technologies unlock tremendous opportunities to improve our lives and also our livelihoods to deliver sustainable development goals. The fourth industrial revolution has brought about a new challenge, Technology is evolving faster than regulators can keep up. Thanks to a collaboration between the Rwandan government and the World Economic Forum, the newly launched Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, domiciled in Rwanda, aims to develop and implement technology governance and policies, as well as act as a bridge between various stakeholders. Um, we're really, I, I like to say, um, a bridge builder you know, between the different stakeholders that exist. You know, um, I, I mentioned earlier that when we talk about technology governance um, in this time that we're living in, we cannot only expect government, uh, rely on government to put in place the, um, uh, the appropriate policies, you know, that can really respond to the rapidly evolving um, you know, context of, of, of these emerging technologies. And so what we try to do is really build that bridge between governments, um, the private sector, bringing in academia as really those thought leaders that are looking forward, um, and also civil society to make, to, to make sure that we're thinking about the ethics um, that we're, we're, we're thinking about also, um, you know, the values that are built into the design of these technologies. Is it human-centered? Are they thinking about, um, you know, the person who has the most sophisticated iPhone, but also the person who has a feature phone? How do you try to deliver um, services equitably, right, and, and make sure that you're using the technology in a strategic way? And I think, you know, really for, uh, for Africa, this is where we have an opportunity to um, to really lead the world, you know, um, in, in creating a more inclusive fourth industrial revolution. Because for us, if we look at the size of the underserved population when it comes to financial services, as an example, it's a huge business opportunity, right? And so if we're designing for those, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, the, 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 the numbers are staggering, you know. And so if we're thinking about how do we build technology to you know, bring them into, uh, you know, the bank population using uh, whether it's blockchain technology um, or artificial intelligence to, to do smarter credit scoring, um, as an example. This is, this is where I think um, we can actually create almost new markets where we don't necessarily have to compete uh, with the U.S. or other, you know, more advanced um, technological societies, um, but we can create a fourth industrial revolution that is grounded in our own context, in our own values, and responds to the complex challenges, but also the limitless opportunities that Africa can provide. The Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution is part of a network of 15 other centers across the world. So far, the center has helped put together a data protection and privacy law. Africa is poised uh, to really benefit, lead and leapfrog within the fourth industrial revolution. 
But to do that, there's so many other building blocks that have to be in place. You mentioned the CFTA, which is really one uh, particular example where we feel uh, with the work of the center. And earlier today, as we launched the center, we talked about some of the very early work that the center has been involved in, which is really helping the ministry, the government of Rwanda, uh, in putting in place the data protection and privacy law. And why is that important? What does that mean for a layman person? Data today is the new gold, is the new oil, depending how you see it. It's a strategic asset. As we embark on our agenda of becoming digital economies across the world, even in Africa very particularly, we're going to be leveraging data in driving policies, in creating new business models, in driving better service delivery, in driving scientific and medical research. But how do you do that uh, in a world where also the same asset that we're talking about there's a lot of issues around mistrust and security that, you know, that have to be unlocked. And so without those kind of regulations like the data protection and privacy regulation, then we won't be able to benefit because you're not able to even collect this data and process it to really unlock the different benefits that we have. So in a nutshell, uh, the, the, the creation of the center today uh, and, and tying it to your question of CFTA is one going to unlock the different governance frameworks, some of them that uh, will hinge on data, unlocking data sharing frameworks across the continent as we trade across borders. Regulators are battling with the uncertainties that have come with the fourth industrial revolution. However, as Boggy Brende, the president of the World Economic Forum puts it, technology without regulation is akin to driving on roads without traffic rules. Maybe let me illustrate it with traffic rules. How would it be uh, to drive on the road if there were no traffic rules at all? It would even be more dangerous and very unpredictable. Uh, the power of the new technologies being artificial intelligence or big data, uh, as also the minister uh, was alluding to, uh, can play a constructive role in and work in the interest of humankind. But we also want traffic rules when it comes to these new technologies because they can also be used in a way that is not beneficial to humankind. So what we're trying with uh, the 15 centers and also now with the great center here in Rwanda is to look at how can, for example, data be the new oxygen in the economy. And uh, at the same time, we also have to think about privacy. We have to think about uh, the rules on how we utilize uh, big data. While policy and regulation is being set up, concerns still remain on whether the continent has the relevant skills to support the growth of the fourth industrial revolution. We did talk about the part of regulations, which is very important because as we talk about talent, I think education has been disrupted largely. We are no longer building talent through the traditional education system. We also build talent while on the job, while experimenting with building um, you know, systems and solutions. And in doing so, you're also increasing you know, the quality and level uh, of, of the talent base that you're really putting in place. Now, back to some of the examples that you shared. We have the Africa Institute for uh, Mathematical Sciences that is specializing in uh, research programs around artificial intelligence and machine learning. You have the Carnegie Mellon University, the Africa campus that is set up here and one of the programs that they are also uh, you know, providing is around data science, AI. But you also have our center uh, for AI that is best within our University of Rwanda. So all these are different uh, pieces of, uh, of uh, education institutions that are helping us to build the much required talent. But that's not enough. I think at the end of the day, uh, while these may be research programs, uh, PhD, masters or you know, you know, bachelor's level degree, we also need to be able to see short term type of programs in data science that, and even other fields that can help in the shortest time possible to bridge the gap of talent that we really have uh, today. And that investment continues to happen. The, the universities I just mentioned today um, are set up as Pan-African universities. And that is very important for us because one, uh, we're establishing ourselves as an innovation hub, but it also means we want to be able to attract talent from across the continent to come and benefit from this world-class education that we've uh, set up here. But at the same time, as we solve 
continental problems, global challenges, you need perspectives that are global. You need perspectives that are beyond just Rwanda. So think about having some students that have come from the western part of Africa or northern and they sit together and they're trying to solve a problem, even if it's a problem around how do we uh, improve healthcare service delivery using AI. Because they understand the context of what it is in a country like Benin, and someone that is coming from Egypt also has that context, then you paired up with someone in Rwanda. When they build solutions, they build solutions that can be applicable to the different markets. And that's why it's important for us, because we're not just creating solutions here, we are creating solutions that can scale elsewhere. So to answer you very briefly, it's not an area that is forgotten, rather it's these parallel investments. Today we are launching the center that is heavily focused on policy and regulation, but the investments in education have started more than eight years ago, and we're going to even find more investments that can be put in place so that we bridge the talent gap. Some of the current technologies tend to replace low-skilled workers, with many fearing the threat or perceived threats to existing jobs. Much as we know, uh, that with these emerging technologies, there's a potential for job losses. I think the quick question is, how do you get there? Because you can't avoid it at some point, right? So rather than um, you know, avoid thinking about it or doing something about it, the key thing is to say what jobs have the potential the next five to 10 years to be relevant within the economy? And what other new jobs are going to be created that will almost overtake the ones that will be lost in five to ten years and what can we do to skill this workforce to get there. I did mention a while ago um, you know some of the academic programs that we have in place but those can only address maybe 10-20 percent of, of what you're looking for so I like what you said reskilling upskilling that is needed um, and how do you do that um, even working very closely with the uh, institutions that have the capacity building mandate in really mapping out which sectors are going to be disrupted the most, which industries are going to be disrupted the most when it comes to uh, the, the increasing adoption of, of digital technologies. Um, I remember a few years ago uh, when government, I mean today uh, the government of Rwanda, most of our services are provided online through a centralized platform which is Irembo. But before then, uh, we were trying to put in place different uh, solutions, tech solutions that can help improve efficiencies within organizations. It was really at the very onset of deploying many of these solutions across government institutions, but it was also an eye-opening experience for us to know that as technology experts, it's not a, just a question of deploying a system, it's actually thinking about the human system interface that is going to happen. And from the onset, before you design the system, you start to train and skill people so that they are comfortable to adopt and not resist some of these uh, emerging technologies. While governments shoulder the bulk of the responsibility as far as regulation and skilling the people are concerned, the role of strong partnerships cannot be overlooked. Allow me to suggest three other ways in which strong partnerships such as this one can accelerate digital transformation. First, by stimulating entrepreneurship through increased investment in the right skills and capacity. Second, by helping to address the financing gaps that prevent Africa's businesses scaling up. Lastly, by working to harmonize Africa's data governance landscape and thereby fast tracking the implementation of the African continental free trade area. Some of these partnerships have already begun and I thank all partners for their promising initiatives.